good morning everyone i'll be speaking on thyroid disease uh, various clinical presentations and a brief management outline so we know thyroid disease is most common orbital disease and itself in india it accounts for about one third of the orbital disorders so what has recently come into the pathophysiology of the thyroid disease is the understanding that uh, the central uh, structure, the central cell which is involved with the orbital fibroblast. But before that, there are many autoantigens and autoantibodies which are involved in the pathophysiology. And uh, along with the involvement of production of various cytokines which lead to the various manifestation uh, of thyroid disease. So let's start with this case, uh, patient itself complained of left eye small since five years. So he was um, unaware that actually his right eye is uh, uh, involved and he has definite lid, upper lid retraction along with uh, lower eyelid fat prolapse. And also if we measure, there was proptosis of four millimeters in the right eye. So this is actually uh, most of us uh, like if it depend upon the subjective, sometimes upon the patient complaints, we actually diagnose them having a left eye in ophthalmos. So looking onto the different phenotypes of thyroid eye disease, uh, there are broadly two types. First is this fat-centric disease, uh, which is characteristically having a uh, lid malpositions and signs. And these are upper and lower eyelid retraction, a temporal flare, and a lid lag. So this is a photograph demonstrate the upper eyelid retraction and on the left eye patient has a lower eyelid retraction and this is how the lid lag look in the down gaze. So the upper eyelid lags behind the contralateral normal eye in the down gaze. Temporal flare basically means uh, relatively more retraction on the lateral side and this is because the lateral horn of the LPS is more stronger structure as compared to the medial horn, which is a delicate structure. So this finding is uh, characteristic of thyroid eye disease. Some of the other manifestations may be non-specific, such as retrobulbar discomfort, foreign body sensation, dryness, tired look, and chemosis. Superior limbic conjunctivitis is one of the signs which is uh, associated with thyroid eye disease. And there may be a simple uh, fat prolapse in the lower eyelid, especially in the younger patient who have more common uh, fat-centric disease. Other aspect, other uh, presentation is the muscle-centric disease in which occurs more in the males in the older age group. And patients typically have involvement of the extraocular muscles. So this lead to the uh, diplopia, the pain on the movement. And uh, <coughs> along with this, uh, there uh, uh, is usually, it is a restrictive disease, so the force reduction test is positive. So some of the patients, uh, they have, uh, might have a ptosis, which is uh, not only uh, demonstrate that they may have an active stage because of the edema, but it may occur also in cases where there is a compressive neuropathy, specifically in muscle-centric disease, and we will rule out myasthenia in such cases also. Other kind of a patients may be having a mole cicatricial disease, you never have an active disease, and gradually progressive proptosis along with the strabismus uh, associated with the lid signs and the uh, restrictive myopathy. Visual loss is uh, fortunately, it's rare, uh, seen in around four to eight percent of the patients, and this thyroid optic neuropathy is caused by the compression at the orbital apex. Uh, if there is a gradual uh, severe proptosis along with the lag of thalmos and the lid lag, then the corneal exposure or melt may also be seen. So just see these two cases on cursory look, they may uh, look like uh, they are typical thyroid disease patient and look similar. But if we cl closely examine them, actually the, uh, the patient on the left side, she has a short onset of disease. She's a known case of hyperthyroidism and has a subjective complaints and also the objective findings. So this patient fits mostly into the medical management, whereas on the patient on the right side, she has a long-standing proptosis, euthyroid, only appearance changes and no symptoms and the objective signs. So she is a candidate for surgical management. So we need to understand the, uh, the classification and before that, the, uh, knowing the Rundle's curve is very important because uh, typically the patients uh, of the thyroid disease, they have a progressive stage 
seen in the first 12 to 18 months, followed by a chronic fibrotic phase. And why this is important? Because if we treat them in the active inflammatory phase itself, then uh, the, uh, the, the ultimate uh, sequelae of the chronic fibrotic phase are seems to be reduced. But this is not that simple because sometimes the reactivation or recurrence of the disease may happen itself in the uh, inflammatory phase because mostly the steroids are given and they are short acting. And even once the uh, chronic fibrotic phase uh, sets up, there can be reactivation even after uh, you have treated uh, surgically like uh, done orbital decompression. So if you look into the classification, uh, initially we had the NOSFEX, which was given by the Werner. Uh, it has a s a several actually disadvantages because we do not see such typical stepwise pattern and it does not grade the activity. So the two commonly followed classification system are UGOGO, that is European Group on Graves Orbitopathy, which, which uh, has a clinical activity score, that is CAS, and for the initial presentation, uh, we have a seven point system. Each, each uh, presentation is given a one point. So there are a maximum of seven points and rest three points uh, are assessed at the follow up period. So we have two points for pain, that is spontaneous pain and gaze evoked pain. Two points for eyelid swelling and erythema. Uh, two points for conjunctiva, again injection and chemosis. And last is the inflammation of caruncle or plica. So let's exercise some of these patients. Uh, symptomatically, she has a pain, pain on the movement. So we give one point each to them. And she has all eyelid edema, erythema, conjunctival injection, chemosis, even the caruncle edema. So she fits, she is having seven out of seven points. And more than equal to four points indicate that it is a clinically active disease. So like, for example, this patient does not have a pain at the rest. There is a pain on movement. And if we calculate the CAS, it's a five to seven. So this is an act, again an active disease. Some patients may have different uh, involvement of both the eyes. Like for example, in this case, if we uh, measure the clinical activity score, it's around three. And uh, on the left side, on the left eye, he has a caruncle involvement, which comes into the fourth. So we need to take the uh, whatever score is higher in cases of uh, patients having asymmetric disease. UGOGO has further classified into mild, moderate to severe, and site-threatening Graves orbitopathy based on uh, the findings of lid retraction, exophthalmos, and diplopia. Another classification system is a visa classification system, which is quite extensive, but is also uh, can be easily uh, understood. It has a f uh, both subjective and the objective complaints points. The vision is, uh, is given a one point, whether the patient has dysthyroid optic neuropathy or not. Inflammation, it has a broad uh, points, a total of 10. Strabismus is again uh, based on the subjective and the objective points. And finally is the exposure, which is given three points. It's a scale of total 20 points. If we look uh, for the activity score for uh, if in the visa classification is actually having a 10 points. And they have broadened the, uh, uh, the scale of the eyelid swelling into 0 to 2. So 0 is absent, 1 is present, but the, the conjunctiva is not overhanging. And the second uh, two points are given if the conjunctiva, uh, <coughs> if the, sorry, for the conjunctiva, if uh, the, it extends anterior to the gray line. So similar for the eyelid, there, uh, the point 0 is given when it is absent, present. If it is not overhanging, and two points if it is causing a roll in a skin or a festoon. So it has a clinical activity score of uh, 10 points. Now coming on to the role of investigation, it is important that uh, many patients may have euthyroid, especially in the Indian scenario, and uh, thyroid eye disease may, uh, may occur simultaneously or even uh, precedes the thyroid dysfunction. So it's important to get the thyroid function test done and also rule out Graves, uh, Graves of thalmopathy and Hashimoto disease by uh, performing these antibodies. The CT scan are commonly used uh, for uh, requested for a patient of thyroid diseases because uh, it is not for the diagnosis that we do them. Uh, diagnosis is basically uh, based on the clinical signs, but in cases of an asymmetric disease or the atypical findings, 
these are may be needed to establish diagnosis in some cases. It is also important uh, CT scan for the uh, surgical management, especially the decompression if it is planned. So we'll, let's take some of the uh, scans of this patient is having clinically a fat-centric disease. So the muscles are typically not that involved. It is predominantly a fat uh, which has deposited into the intraconal space and uh, causing the proptosis and the eyelid retraction. MRI are uh, not that required. They may demonstrate the activity because of the T1 and T2 images. Exam advantage is that there is no exposure to the radiation. CT scan uh, in some cases may also predict the, it has shown that it can predict the uh, occurrence of disordered optic neuropathy and it can be calculated from a Barrett index uh, which uh, calculates the, uh, the two parameters as the vertical and the horizontal uh, muscle index. So vertical is calculated by summing up the, uh, the width, uh, the height of superior and the inferior rectus divided by the total width. And if it is uh, more than 67%, that indicates that the patient has chances of developing this thyroid optic neuropathy. So whichever index, uh, horizontal or vertical is more, we account that. Even the index uh, uh, about more than 60% has shown that the patient uh, can, uh, is a predictive of uh, optic neuropathy. The diagnosis of optic neuropathy is actually based on the more on the clinical signs, that is the decreased vision, color vision, RAPD, and clinically the patient has optic dyslexia, and uh, sometimes we, uh, we may need to do the visual fields and VEP. We need to know the also the risk factors, especially the modifiable risk factors such as the radioactive iodine, cigarette smoking, and thyroid dysfunction. Patient, uh, we should aim for the euthyroid uh, uh, status. And clinically, these are some of the risk factors associated with the optic neuropathy, the older age, male gender, smoking, diabetes, significant strabismus with mild proptosis. So uh, actually, the mild proptosis uh, is uh, uh, one of the uh, very high predictor of this thyroid optic neuropathy, especially because of the involvement of the extraocular muscles. So I'll just briefly cover up the management. Uh, first is obviously because of the varied clinical spectrum, we need to establish the diagnosis first. That is the first step uh, we have to do and then assess the activity and the severity, plot a rental curve for that patient, uh, look for the risk factors, especially the smoking, achieve the youth thyroid status. And first important thing is to rule out the visual loss, that is the thyroid optic neuropathy. Clinically, uh, if the activity score, uh, if we do on UGOGO, uh, if it is more than equal to seven, and on visa, if it is more than equal to five out of 10, then we can treat them with the corticosteroids. I'll just discuss the oral versus IVMP. And even uh, in the active phase, sometimes the patients may not do well on steroids. So we, uh, the role of biologics and immunomodulatory therapy is also coming. So this is a brief uh, treatment algorithm uh, I've just taken from the one of the paper, which uh, <coughs> classify that if the patient is mild, we treat it symptomatically. If it is moderate to severe, then steroids are needed. Radiotherapy uh, has a role in uh, the patients who progress in spite on steroids. And if it is dysthyroid optic neuropathy, then we need uh, the treatment urgent, uh, start them on IV steroids. So this is just uh, what we do for mild Graves' orbitopathy. Selenium has a role uh, in mild non-inflammatory orbitopathy. It leads to the better appearance. And for the moderate and severe active disease, they are, are usually treated with the corticosteroids. So IV pulse therapy has a more uh, chances of about 80% resolution of the symptoms compared to the oral steroids, which have lesser efficacy. Radiotherapy is also has a role specifically when given along with the corticosteroids because the combination uh, uh, leads to the better efficacy of about 88% resolution. When the disease is inactive, the, uh, these are the sequential surgeries which are performed. I'll just uh, leave it to Dr. Tarjani. So the oral steroids are uh, efficacious in about 60%, but they have uh, side effects. So usually if the patient is active, it's better to start on the ivocorticosteroids. There are different regimens, but one should uh, uh, the keep in mind that we have a maximum dose of eight grams combined for all the cycles. 
So this is an example of a patient uh, with the severe uh, disease, uh, uh, clinically active, which is treated with the intravenous methylprednisolone, and the picture changes in just uh, one cycle. Immunosuppressors were used. Uh, uh, they may allow weaning of corticosteroids, but also they are associated with the, uh, the side effects. And what is now focus is on more on the biologics, which, uh, uh, which treat the pathophysiology from the initial start. Also, the radiotherapy is also coming up because it acts on the different cells itself, that is the lymphocytes and the fibroblasts, and, do the, uh, and uh, decrease the, their proliferation. Rituximab is one of the common agents which, were, which has been used as it, and is being used for the active thyroid disease which is not responsive to the corticosteroid therapy. And the recent drug uh, which has come up is the insulin uh, like growth factor receptor drug that is the teprotumab which has been used as an infusion uh, in the patients of uh, moderate to severe active thyroid disease. I'll just touch upon that external beam radiotherapy. Uh, in, uh, I, I don't think in India it is much used, but when combined with the corticosteroid, it has a very high uh, uh, efficacy. There are specific indications like uh, for if, uh, the, the, if there is a dysthyroid optic neuropathy, active thyroid disease with moderate to severe that is not responding to steroids. Uh, if there is an progressive strabismus, and uh, uh, and actually what has seen is that delays the need for uh, urgent surgical depression in some of uh, decompression in some of the patient so side effects are there it is avoided usually in younger patients uh, uh, patients of hypertension and diabetes and uh, but uh, uh, even in low doses it can uh, be uh, used as a uh, modality in active disease so just to summarize that, we should remember that thyroid disease has varied clinical presentation and watch, look for them. Uh, the late signs are quite characteristics. They help us in establishing the diagnosis and we need a multidisciplinary team that is endocrinologist, rheumatologist, along with the radiotherapist uh, for treating such patient. Medical management is dependent on whether the patient is having active or inactive disease. Uh, look for the clinical activity score, do it uh, at all the follow-ups and plot the Reynolds curve because that is very important also. Uh, the various, there are advances which are happening in the immunotherapy and their aim is to prevent the long-term sequelae of the disease. Thank you.